so um, as you know, CPRE has a long standing interest in hedgerows. Um, we campaign for the hedgerows regulations, which are first legal protection for many important, well, majority of important hedgerows. And of course, we advocate for more hedgerows, so 40% increase in the ascent in hedgerows by 40% uh, by 2050. And then for the better management of hedgerows as well. And we have um, lots of uh, seven hedgerow hero projects this year, which is planting, restoring hedgerows. And of course, this event is part of that for CPRA Shropshire. So uh, thank you, Derek, for um, doing your presentation. So if you'd like to start, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Derek Hale. I uh, trained as a psychiatric nurse, actually, took a very early retirement. Um, one day I'd taken my younger son, volunteer coppicing. And as I drove back, I noticed the gaps in the hedgerows with the bits of barbed wire and the bits of post and rail filling the gaps. Remembered my father said the hedges should be laid. And two weeks later, the Brailsford and District Ploughing and Hedge Cutting Society course was advertised, which is the course I now organise. I went on that um, and that's where I started. Uh, I was extremely lucky. I got time on my hands and I bumped into somebody I knew a completely different um, part of life. I happened to be a three times Supreme Champion, National Champion. Um, I got some time. He was a very generous man and he swore at me regularly for five years. Um, and away we went. And I've worked my way up through um, competition level to champion level. Uh, I've held various posts in Hedge Lane and I'm still doing it. Happy slides. Like start to your <laughs> slides, okay? I'm going to share your, and I will tell me when you want to move on from yeah. slide to slide. Yeah, that's just that's just my introductory one. It's my tool bag, my coat, the maul that I use for driving stakes, apple head, hickory handle. Uh, there's an axe and a spade. It's that is that's just the introductory one. We can move on to the next one, which is one of my dr <coughs> line drawings. <coughs> Just use that as a background. We're talking about the origins of Edge Lane. Now, um, people have erected thorny barriers around the villages. Nomadic peoples erect temporary thorny stockades around the stock. That's a little man and his, and his animal with a, a thorny stockade. Um, the actual Hedge Lane, the archaeological record goes back about 5,000 years. I think we've probably been doing it since we could had tools sharp enough to do it. Um, Caesar invaded the low countries and found the locals had um, built barriers, thorny barriers, which they couldn't penetrate, his soldiers couldn't penetrate or even see through. So we've got a start there, of hedge, actual hedge laying 2000 years ago. And so it went on, hedge laying is practiced various countries, perhaps in Europe, the more braiding hedges, the more weave them rather than lay them as we do. Um, there were 250,000 miles of hedge planted in America, which you wouldn't think, but uh, as the settlers moved from the eastern seaboard west, they took bags of Osage orange seeds with them, which is like a mega hawthorn, and planted them, 250,000 miles of them. Um, and as they grew, they wove them together. So in three or four years, they'd have a barrier, horse high, all strong and hop tight, which describes a nice late Derbyshire tree rather well as well. Um, Either through some severe winters or the invention of barbed wire, 1870s odd, those hedges were lost. Um, uh, they used the, the stems of the plants as, hedge, as fence posts, but most of the hedges were lost. And then in the 1920s, 30s, in the Dust Bowl period, they planted hedges again to prevent soil erosion. So that's the American side of it. Uh, I met a man who'd farmed in South Africa. This is where the crocodiles come in. It farmed in South Africa, laid hedges with their local ferocious plant, and for the, for the purpose of stopping the crocodiles eating his cattle and the hippopotamuses eating his cabbages. So we have a worldwide view of hedge laying. Um, lots of it, I've mentioned Europe, where the braid hedges are even more than lay them as we do, or well, lay them higher. So it's still practiced. Whether there's a man who had a phone call from asking if he'd go and lay a hedge. And he said, where? And he said, Tasmania. So he's been out. I think he's retired now, but he was out. He's laying hedges in this country in winter and in Tasmania and Australia in their winter. There's hawthorn hedges out there. 
So we've got a fairly wide worldwide view. Is that all right? <laughs> Is that going down all right? Uh, next slide, please. Let's let's move on. Right, I've done three slides here to compare different cutting techniques. This is coppicing. This is cutting, which will preserve the, which will lengthen the the the, the life of each plant. You know, a hazel plant has got a certain life. If you coppice it, it will extend it 100, 150 years, and you get a product. Uh, that's coppicing. Move next slide, please. Bing. Pollarding. Uh, that's in summer. In winter, you'd see poles, which could be used for fencing. Cop pollarding is simply coppicing, but done higher so the animals can't eat the new shoots. So, um, yeah, any questions about that as we go along? But well, let's move on to the next one now, which will be pleaching. Next slide. Right, this is where we're getting onto the uh, back of slide. <laughs> and with the photo, please. That's the one. We'll skip the line drawing in a minute. Uh, bleaching, this is hedge laying. This is where we cut in to, to build a hedge. Now, people ask how far through should you cut? I can't tell you because every stem is different. It might have a bit of disease, a bit of canker. You cut in about four fifths of the way through and you're aiming to get a hinge at ground level. It's a hinge it's so that the as the stem goes back, it won't split up the grain. It won't fall flat on the ground. It's got some resilience. Uh, the, that strap that holds it still to the piece on the ground. If it's too thin, the, the edge will die, or the pleach will die. Too thick, and you get a lot of growth off the pleach. Um, sort of get floating hedges, floating on a, an old layer, which is not what you want. You want about fifths of the, the plant's energy going up the pleach and keep and producing shoots and knitting the hedge together. But four fifths of the plant's energy go into that stool at the bottom, that little stub, which is of a critical height. That's where you want the bulk of the new, the strongest new growth to come from. You get shoots about a half an inch below that cut. You get a cluster of them at first. The strongest will survive. The weak ones die back and that strongest shoot will become a new stem. And it's an absolute miracle. You've got to be catch you've got to see it 10 years later because 10 years' time the pleachers will have died back and you'll get a new stem coming straight out the ground from that point. You won't see where you've been cutting. It's magic. That's that's a principle. Right. Next slide, please. Right, leave that one. That's that's the same thing that I've just that the photo that I've just explained with the photograph. So next one. Right. If you leave a hedge, we just leave it to its own devices, it becomes a line of trees. Uh, I explained that the line drawings were amused my son who, who put this PowerPoint presentation together. So he thought he'd leave some in. Um, get a line of trees, trees die off, you get gaps. You've got not a lot of cover. So the only birds that will nest in these will be pigeons and magpies. It's a, the scruffy nest at the top of one of those trees there. So next slide, please. Right, this is Bernie the bull. Uh, Bernie can walk between these trees, ramble from field to field, service the cows, do what he likes. So there's no fence there, there's no barrier. So next slide, please. This is Bernie looking quite confused and rather frustrated because somebody's laid the hedge and he can't get through. He can't visit his, his, his females in the next field. Is it rather restricted? This is a very quiet talk, this is. Nobody asking questions yet. Everyone's um, muted, actually, Derek. So oh um, would you, would you <laughs> well, rather meet you. unmute people? Yeah, well, we don't, we don't want everybody chipping in at once. Well, I'm prepared to answer questions. Um, please, everyone, remember this sort of definition um, of a laid hedge. It's a living stock-proof barrier. So it'll be stock-proof, depending on what kind of stock you're trying to fence. If it's a garden hedge, it's still, it's a living fence. It's a living barrier of some sort. Uh, it can be quite small, it can be quite large, but it, it's alive. And we cut to promote growth from the base of the hedge, which is what I've just explained. You're trying to, you're rejuvenating the hedge. You're making it grow from the ground and prolonging the life of each individual plant. If you think we've got, most of our hedges were, were laid, were planted during the Enclosures Acts. And they've remained alive. We've still got them because they've been laid over yeah, two or three hundred years. And we'll go on to how we could lose them shortly. 
So laid in the appropriate regional styles. There's been over 30 different regional styles recorded in the UK. They've all evolved according to topography, materials available, and function. What kind of fence you want, what can you need? And I was discussing this with a dry stone waller locally, and he said, and they should look good. And so I've added that one as well. Uh, if it looks right, it, it, it is right. And, and there's, there's a definite aesthetic appeal to laid hedges. You, you drive around the countryside and, and they, they, they stand out. The good ones do. The bad ones stand out as well. Are there any new styles? Um, yes, there's, uh, there are certain wildlife styles which have been evolved. Um, there's, there's some move towards a more economical style. Um, and there are some machine to mechanical styles which do not work. So yes, new styles are being evolved, which is which is the way it should be, really, isn't it? Um, so yeah, there are new styles. Uh, there, there's one where they stick a, a pole pruning saw into the bottom edge, make cuts, and then push the whole thing over with a digger. That doesn't work. But there's other styles where you cut, as I've described, and probably use a bit less staking. Um, a bit it's a bit it's a bit bit bit, bit scruffier basically but it still works so yes there are new some style there are some new styles uh next style next next slide please uh this i put this one in for two reasons one it's an allotment edge uh very close to where i live i laid it whenever you take a photograph and look at the photograph you'll see your mistake and sarah picked that mistake up straight away when we talked about it yesterday um we don't have to mention it again. Oh, well, there's a little cross. You can point it out. It's the pleat I should have straightened, but I've left sticking it out. <laughs> I'll put that in as well because there was a woman at the allotments who wanted to try binding. She didn't do hedge laying. She'd seen the binding and wanted to have a go. So I, I got a couple of bun bundles of binders for her, showed her the first on the first few stakes how to do it, and left her to it. And that's the result. Uh, she had aching shoulders, she said. But that is that is neat binding. That's nice. Um, and that was the first attempt. So to encourage everybody listening to this, go and have a go. Right. Next one, please. This is a result of repeated flailing. This is this fits the, the introduction to this as, as well, um, by Emma, because if you keep flailing a hedge, this is what you get. You get the the, the woolly sheep on spindly legs effect, that matted top. Um, it's no longer a fence really things can push through the bottom of it it's not providing much agricultural ecology or ecological benefit it's not doing much at all you can see in the bottom that it's been laid badly in the past that's an old layer in the middle of the picture there's an old layer with basically floating off the ground with hedge coming off it um it's been left too thick there's there's been no growth from ground level. The growth come from the, the part in the air. So if you're going to lay that, if you would let that to grow another four or five years on and then lay it, you'd have to lay that one back in the ground and lay off it. I'm talking uh, a foreign language at the moment, probably. So do interrupt if you like. Um, this is what we get. Um, if you keep flailing a hedge, the gaps appear, the plants are dying off. And eventually, it's like, as I said in my introduction, eventually you'll see pieces of post and rail fence, lengths of barbed wire, bridging those gaps. So we've got a problem. Hedge lane is very expensive, time consuming, flailing is cheap. So we've got to find a balance somewhere, reserve the hedges. All right, next one, please. Derek, could I just stop a moment? Yeah, uh, I noticed sure. someone had, had raised their hand at that point, but because everyone's muted, yeah. I just wonder if you can put your questions into chat. And Derek, you can pick them up from chat, can't you? I can't see chat can. with, with my screen, you see. I've got... If the gentleman would like to put his question into chat, then Derek will, will answer yeah. it. Thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll put it in the chat now. Thank you. Thank you. I've got... Uh... I've only got the new styles at the moment. Have, have I missed anybody? Shall I press on? 
Yes, please. I think I think that gentleman's going to put his question into the chat, so it'll it'll appear. Okay, in I'll, I'll check that again in a moment. Okay, thank um, you. Back to um, what we've covered so far on the definition. This is a picture of a hedge. The winter after the winter it was laid. This is one by my mentor Jeff, and you've got this. You've got the the, the thinner new shoots of the pleachers of the the laid part of the hedge, which are knitting the hedge together, making it bulkier, solid, more impenetrable. And right down on the bottom right, you can see some thicker shoots that are coming off the stools of those, that short piece I mentioned. And they even correspond to two of the laid pleachers. So where's your little cross gone? <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, there's your little cross. The thickest, thicker shoots there, they will eventually replace those stems that have been laid. I've got, I've got a question come in. How might you tackle floated hedges as shown in slide 20? 20, cry. Um, don't bother about jumping ahead, that's fine. You've got the picture again. You need to, it's not probably the best example, but you'd need to lay that one. You basically dig a trench. You lay on the ground or dig a trench to lay it into. And the vertical ones coming off it, you lay it as if they were growing, growing out of the ground. When you lay it into a trench or on the ground, you hope it's going to strike and it's going to root and form a new stem. You've got to get it down. Does that, uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Derek. It's just that's a lot of what I'm trying to tackle this year. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to <laughs> pick your brain. <laughs> you'll have a lot of that to tackle. If you're tackling old hedges, you're going to have a lot of that. There's some very bad hedge laying done 30, 40, 50 years ago, and uh, that's the result. So, uh, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So, uh, another slide or two on it. Right. After that one, we've done that one. Um, skim over this one, really, but this is me in a, it's in a competition, but um, I suppose I'm making the point here that you, certainly in the Derbyshire style and other styles, you build to a height as you progress forwards. So I'm laying the edge, progressing to the right of the picture, and I'm building it to a height as I go along. So it's Derbyshire edge, it'll be four feet high. Um, so that's what I'm working to. Uh, Sarah asked about a lot being a hot. A, a lot of holly being there as well. We did say holly is quite a special plant in that it's got a couple of growing seasons and it's very susceptible to frost. So uh, back to the folklore bit, it's uh, holly in May. Lay it right at the back end of the season, after the season finishes even. Um, uh, or the other expression is um, not now, not ever. It, it can fail, it, it can go black, it can, it can die on you. But if you get it right, it flourishes. It's wonderful. But it's just just tricky. Sometimes we protect the stools with sacking, uh, keep the frost off them. So an interesting plant to lay. Not that you want to all the time. Right, next one, please. Right, this is a hedge close to my home, which I wanted to get my hands on for ages, and suddenly it was offered to me. Now, I'll put this one in because I've seen pamphlets published by certain organisation, if you say anything over a certain diameter, you have to copy it. Um, there's another, if, if, if it's really desperate, if you can't lay a hedge, copy it and replant, but always try to lay if you can. So this one was certainly over that, that measurement I saw in the leaflet. Uh, the height you can see from that telegraph pole. I wanted to get the bounds on it, and I finally did. So the next slide shows, next slide please. That's the laid hedge. That's what we did. Now, the hedge beyond that gate, it went past um, the edge of a wood and it was, plants were seeking light, they're getting shaded, so they went higher. So we started off on that part, the height of that pole. So next slide, please. And you can see beyond the gate, the hedge is still laid. Um, and the hedge was going, it was heading for the height of those trees. It was an interesting job, a very, a very satisfying job because it, it was on a bus route to attract a lot of attention. 
and did HLA in a load of good, I hope. So that's Derbyshire style, um, clean face. That will have a back on it, uh, a bushy back, two to three feet wide, top of the hedge right down to the ground. Uh, I mentioned to Sarah, as a little lad came along and said, I could climb that. And we said, yeah, fine, get on with it. And when you swing your leg over the top, you're going to find that two feet wide thorny back. It didn't bother. Right, next one, please. Derbyshire style hedge again. This was uh, at the bottom of somebody's garden overlooking a park. I just put that one in because my mentor said, well, that's match work. And it's um, it's always this thing, well, our competition is different to, to piecework. Yes, usually. But um, you can strive to cut to a standard. Uh, that, that was pretty good. Uh, the owner said, came down one day and said, I've got a Vista. And I said, we charge extra for Vistas. Yes, uh, about chainsaws. Um, yes, we use chainsaws for commercial work and for matches. It's, it can be partly due to the size of the hedge. It's not just for speed. Because um, you can get, I've mentioned the poor hedge you lay in 30, 40, 50 years ago. And, those, and that question about the, the high features, floating hedges. You can get the bar of a chainsaw into places where you can't swing an axe. So you can actually save timber. Where you lose timber because you can't manage it, you can actually manage it with a chainsaw. If it's in competitions in Derbyshire and Staffordshire, certainly, if you don't show axe work, you won't get in the points. You, you won't get any prizes. You, you've got to show you can swing an axe. You clean all your, if you use a chainsaw, clean all your cuts up with the axe and the bill up. So yes, we use chainsaws a lot but it's not just for speed, it's, it's for the sake of the hedge as well. Is that okay? Right. Yes, thank uh, you, that's perfect. Right, doing all right, aren't we so far? Um, yeah, please keep throwing the questions in. I, I do respond to questions rather well. Is that, is that the next one? Um, yeah. Okay, next one. I'm going through regional styles. This is a Devon style. It's that's actually the national championship, so it's flat on the ground. But they in Devon, they're on top of an eight to twenty foot high bank, a, a turf faced or stone faced bank, and that hedge is only eighteen inches, two feet high, and it could be a, a, a double cone one. It could have that down either side of the, the bank with a, a space down the middle. Um, part of the hedge maintenance there is repairing the bank and before you lay the hedge. Uh, stakes aren't used, but crooks are. As you can see, those, those inverted V-shaped crooks are what are holding the hedge in place. And they have a lot of smooth sort of wood, smooth grey bark wood, somebody referred to it. Not so much hawthorn down there, much, much more hazel, that sort of thing. Okay, next one, please. Right, Somerset style. Uh, Two lines of stakes, you can't see them there, they're, they're staggered. Um, there's another line on the other side um, between those. They they are holding the pleaters in place. You see at the bottom, the pleaters are passed behind one and through and the brush is held between the stakes as well. I think, and it's got a red ribbon on it, so that was a winning one at a competition. I think that's been won a couple of times. It's um, Winning competitions is about the quality of your work. It's uh, and it can go to any style, obviously in any area that you're competing in, but in national championships, there are a range of styles good as well. So the next one, please. This is Cheshire style. Now that's evolving. There's a question about new styles. This is definitely evolving. It's becoming more like um, a Staffordshire hedge, which is quite like a sort of smaller Derbyshire hedge. Uh, in Valerie Greaves' book, Hedge Lane Explained, the Cheshire style was described as three foot six tall and 10 inches wide with only six inches of brush. It's got a clean face, very smooth, clean, no twigs on, on, the, on this side, side to the camera. And traditionally only six inches of, of twigs and leaves and stuff on the back. Um, that was said to be because of a 13 year crop and um, animal rotation. They didn't put stock next to it until it was well established again. 
it's becoming wider and thicker. Uh, one of the Cheshire men said that a blackbird should be able to fly through it. It's just sort of heavy pruning. Yeah, you, you take plenty off and it grows like mad. That one, that particular example, I think was cut by Malcolm Johnson, who is an absolute genius. I was cutting next to him and I think I probably took a picture of it, not mine. Um, it's it's really good work. It's taken the heels off, that's you know, the piece on the ground, that stool at the bottom where you want the regrowth, taking those off with an axe. His axe work would be immaculate. I was saying yesterday when we're looking through this stuff, it's ditched it. This We refer to that as ditching. It's digging a, like a, a flower border along the front edge in a competition. Now that contrast of dark earth against your white cuts shows you're cutting nicely. But we think maybe it's to do with, it's sort of remnant from hedging and ditching competitions when you have to do both. But um, if you have time to do it, it's a good thing to do. It gets rid of the weeds as well. Okay, next one, please. South of England style, double brush style. It's got, it's not got a clean face. It's got uh, branches, twigs and leaves on both sides. Sheep country, I presume. And South of England binding. It's quite a, quite a deep multiple kind of binding. It's uh, another winning one. Okay, next one, please. This is me cutting Staffordshire style. It doesn't illustrate it too well. Um, Chainsaw kit again, as you see. Uh, Staffish style, you use pieces of long, thin pieces of wood that you've put to one side and make sure the next competitor doesn't pinch them. I make that mistake often. Um, and you start at the right hand side where you've finished and start twisting those in with the live stuff that's in the top of the hedge as well to tighten the top of the hedge. It neatens the top of the hedge. You can just about see where I'm doing it on that last last two or three stakes. So that, that's a feature of Staffordshire style. Staffordshire style is three foot six wide, about 18 inches wide. It's like a, when I traveled west from Derby, I sort of find that I found that the, the hedges were reducing in size as I went across. Derbyshire is a big solid hedge. Staffordshire is a little bit more dainty and Cheshire is even more dainty still. You have to, you have to adjust to each style as you go along. Are we okay with that? which case we'll go to the next one. A Lancashire Westman style, again, double brush, sheep country. You've got stakes down each side. Um, brush, as in branches, twigs, leaves on either side. And that will stop the sheep poking the noses through and eating the shoots that are coming up in the middle. There is, in that style, there's a, a sort of an opening down the middle to get light onto the shoot, which, don't do as well as in the, the single face, the smooth face sides, the clean face sides, face sided hedges. They, because they're shaded, they, they grow slower, but once they get sort of clear of the top of the edge, they go well. So the, the regrowth is brilliant about three years on, not straight away. Next one, please. Yorkshire style, a bit hard to understand. It's, um, you sort of cut everything off and put a frame around it. It's obviously you don't put animals next to it because they could just eat it all of it. Um, it works. I mean, it, again, it's like hard pruning. That hedge will grow like mad. And then when it's grown, you can put animals back next to it. It's, I've not done that style. And there's a, you know, Sarah asked a question, why have you got stakes on both sides of that row? You think you put them on the side. I don't, I can't explain that fully. It must be the best way of getting that top rail straight. But I, it's not the way I'm used to doing things. Um, some very, very good cutters. A friend of mine lives in Northumberland. He's, he keeps winning the Yorkshire class at the national championships. Very, very good cutter. Uh, and that, that is sound. That's some, that's good cutting, good build, good cutting, clean cuts there. It's all right. Okay, next one, please. Derbyshire style, again, I mean, you naturally think I'm going to keep pushing Derby style as the best style. It's a very versatile style. Um, that's Jeff Key, who was my mentor, the man I mentioned, who was very generous. Um, that's his work. You can see the, the quality of it. And then the inset, there's the growth after six months. So fine, fine regrowth. Again, we're cutting for regrowth. That's, that's a, a principal aim. 
Right, next one. Uh, some of my work, I've put that one in because um, that's witch elm, which is a bit unusual. I actually found seven different species in that hedge. Uh, we can mention hedge mixes from that, actually. Yeah, sorry. We've laid that with the direction of traffic. That lane is probably narrower than it appears there. There's some heavy traffic comes along it. So there's a theory, motorways are like as well, that you, you lay so that the the um, the gusts from the passing traffic don't lift the bleachers. Um, I mentioned hedge mixers there. I'm against hedge mixers um, because there was some ridiculous ones put forward. Basic thing is plants compete. They compete for nutrients, light, water, and they grow at different rates. So if you put a mix of plants together, they don't they don't necessarily get on. Some are allopathic as well. Some will kill each other. So, <clears throat> sorry. With hedge mixers, you can end up with a, a gappy line of shrubs instead of a hedge. There seems to be little thought sometimes into what a hedge is going to be like five years, 10 years, 20 years after planting. So hawthorns, the, the plant of choice, you can put some other things in in reasonably low percentages and mix them carefully as well. There's another thing you give volunteers, particularly a, a load of plants to plant in bundles and they plant by the bundle. So you get a hedge and it's a one block of one thing and a block of another thing. I laid a hedge locally, beautiful start with some wild plum stuff, fabulous. And it ended up with uh, some scrubby looking spindle at about three meter intervals. It, uh, my reputation escalated when I started and crashed when I got towards the end. There's nothing to lay. So some hedge mixers don't make any sense at all. Um, Jeff, my mentor, said, do, do what our ancestors did, plant hawthorn. They know what they're doing. Um, another idea, if other plants find their way in, fine. It's okay. Um, but again, you've got to, have to manage hedge. You don't want to leave elder in, for instance. It's um, hedges, you don't just leave a hedge, it's got to be maintained over the years. So, oh, next one, please. Uh, this is, sorry, it's Derbyshire head again, but um, there you go. I've put this one in because that's at our local annual match. And, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, and that's three different classes in that same match. We've got the juniors, novice, senior local and this consistency um, it's a nice piece of hedge it's well laid yeah elder thank you for the question elder grows very quickly it's i'm not sure it's allopathic or not but it doesn't other plants don't like it much at all so if you have elder i've actually seen this recommend actually handed out as a hedge mix plant it will Grow like mad, it will die, it will leave a gap. Um, it's not good in your hedge. It's uh, it's not it's not it's it's an unwelcome plant. It's just doesn't do the, the hedge much good at all. Could I teach you how to cut, please? Yes, come on my course, um, <laughs> which we're going to arrange today. Um, yeah, I'll do that towards the end, if you don't mind. I'll, I'll go through basic cutting. And what I'd quite like to do one day, what I'm sort of planning to do, is a video presentation or something, just showing you basic cutting. But remind me again as we get to the end of this talk, and I'll, I'll cover how to do basic cutting. Okay, next one, please. Yeah, this is me in a, in a Midlands match, actually winning uh, not much more than that, really. I think... I think we've got willow binders. We'll come to sawn stakes and willow binders. Oh, hedgerow trees. We'll do that as well. Um, I've seen the question. Traditionally, hazel stakes, hazel binders, when they're not, when they're in short supply, sawn stakes and, and willow binders. Don't like them as much, not nearly as much. Um, hedgerow trees, yes, fine. Uh, if you're planting, I'd plant them out of the hedge line. If they're in the hedge line, naturally they'll shade the hedge plants and you'll get a gap. Um, things won't grow 
too well under heavy shade and, and being starved of water and nutrients. So hedgerow trees, great. But if you can, plant them a couple of metres outside the hedge line. You don't always have that choice, I know. And yes, let's have hedgerow trees for wildlife. Um, I will cover. I will cover wildlife because there's some very important points we made there. We've got cutting and wildlife to bring in. Okay, I won't forget. Next one, please. Now, can we go on to the next one from that? It's the same piece of hedge, but it makes a point. The Midland style of, of hedge lane, traditionally, you'd set the stakes quite way, but quite well back from the line of the stems. And you drop the pleachers through between the stakes. You might drop a pleach, two pleats, put a stake in, drop another one out into the field, put a stake in, and so on. And you'd have a hedge, maybe four or five feet wide, put stakes and binders on. Again, they're sawn stakes and willow binders, which is not traditional, but that's what's available there. Um, the stakes and binders form a sort of hedge long clamp, and give it strength. A traditional four or five feet width of brush on the back it's it's beef country it's stop bullocks so it's a good strong edge there it was laid on a fairly short cycle um we've demonstrated this summer as well um so you come back eight ten years later lay it again you cut the old pleaches off the back which will be dead on the ground by then or even leave them and lay on top of them lay again the thing is with that the with the Pleach is sloping so far back and the stakes are far back. When you come to mechanical cutting, you take all the new growth off the front. It's, so it doesn't, it does, it's not good for mechanical cutting at all. If you look further down towards, I'm not there, somebody else is there. The next, the next plot in that match, that's mine. And I'm a Derbyshire man. And I'll, I'll build live wood up to the top of the stakes. I'm probably a bit more upright. This is... So 90, now 90 year old man who laid the first piece there, but traditional Midlands cutter. The, the Midlands style now is more upright like the Derbyshire style and it will keep its sort of rectangular shape for longer. So it responds to mechanical cutting. You can keep mechanical cutting it for 50 years and it will keep its shape. Whereas a traditional Midlands style, you'd lose it. You'd lose all your new growth. So. There's a question about new styles, wasn't there? Well, the Midland style has evolved into something which is more suitable for modern times. That's all right. Um, and next one, please. Garden hedge. Uh, just to show you a Hawthorne garden hedge. Um, the, uh, the council stepped in on that estate and, and told the developers they must keep hedges. And this uh, this poor couple were the only uh, the only house that on the estate which had a hedge. Um, the nice part about that was that uh, I was going to take a trophy back to my mentor, and it was tea time, and you mustn't disturb his tea. But I got a call from this couple about this hedge, and so I phoned my mentor and said, "I've had this call," and he abandoned his tea, and we met at the hedge. It was in a village between his village and where I live. And we laid it between us in a day. Um, I did the cutting. I, you know, I did the basic cutting. He built the hedge as I laid the pleachers towards him. Satisfying day. Nice, upright, square Derbyshire hedge and functional. It's narrow enough to be a garden hedge. It's doing a job. Okay, next one, please. I put this on because it's privet. Uh, one of the questions I anticipated would be that, you know, what can you lay? Well, you can lay anything, but they don't all respond the same way. They don't all shoot from that stool, that stub at the bottom. Uh, blackthorn's a prime example. It spreads by suckering. Some argument about, arguments about whether it will sprout from the stools as well, but generally it's a, it's a good example of what won't. Hawthorn does, blackthorn doesn't. Um, I was asked about to lay land eye. Yes, you can lay lay land eye and they will lay there. They will do nothing, they won't die. It'll look like a sloping log cabin. Uh, so that's not a plant of choice. I laid my own garden laurel hedge that responded brilliantly. So basically lay anything, don't all respond the same way. That's privet and it's laid Midland style for a front garden. And 
I think that's worked. Um, I've even incorporated the Midland style six inches of, of flying brush, that those leafy stuff above the line of binders. The theory there is that it was a hunting country where the Midland style evolved and the horses would aim over that brush so they miss the binders and the tops of the stakes. We're not having horses jump in from the main road into that person's garden. So that's the theory. Uh, privet lays well, cuts well, and it takes forever. That was one long job, one long day's job that was, because there's hundreds of, st of stems in there. Okay, next one, please. Yeah, that's me in another match. It's uh... Ah, thank you for that question. <laughs> it's a very timely question too. Yes, I, I said the Midland style traditionally was had this uh, hedge long clamp of stakes and binders. Derbyshire style, we use stouter stakes, we use thicker stakes, and we actually weave the hedge onto them. So we're building the strength in it as we work along. If that makes sense, it's the, the pleachers go in and out the stakes firmly. So that's how we get our strength, and we don't need binders. We don't have binders on Derbyshire style because we don't have copies products. Um, the example I usually use where I live in the edge of Derby, Derby City, southwest edge. The if I travel two miles down to River Trent, over Swartzden Bridge, into South Derbyshire and Leicestershire, there's hazel stakes and binders available, and I'll cut Midland style. If I go in the opposite direction through Derbyshire, there's no hazel stakes and binders, and we use sawn stakes, for which there's various stories about offcuts from pit props, there's certainly offcuts from um, putting boards in sawmills traditionally, but we use an awful lot more now. Uh, one of our local suppliers sells 10,000 stakes a year, and there are a couple of suppliers. So we're laying quite a lot of hedge in Derbyshire. But the answer to the question, we weave the pleachers onto the stakes and make the hedge strong as we as we as we work along as we go in that pleat should be working left to right but uh, we don't we don't lay the pleasures in state later we do the whole lot in one go right that's that one i think next next slide please yeah no lots of pictures of me with trophies and the like but um the reason for that one i've got the regrowth trophy from the previous year's match and I only put that one in because if you're having a picture of yourself taken stand in front of the hole pick your worst piece of edge and hide it which of what's I've done there I think that's hazel stakes and willow binders what was available uh, that's about the Beamish Museum as it happens next one please Midland style that actually that's a national championship that actually shows that the stakes set back that that bit further than it would be for a Derbyshire edge. Okay, it's not a bad illustration of what you call laying off. Um, you're laying the pleachers off more to the back and through the hedge. It also shows you, we, we get accused of cutting all the, all, the, all the blossom and fruit of hedge. There's actually rather a lot left on there. The hedge has been laid, there'll be a big pile of brush, but the fruiting, the flowering and fruiting bodies of the hedge are there. So the wildlife benefits remain, reduced temporarily, but remain. Okay, next one, please. Yeah, this is, um, this is a, was laid in a competition by Jonathan Stafford, who I'll be seeing later this evening. At Midland style, he's a Derbyshire man, Midland style cutting, and it's immaculate. I mean, uh, you, you couldn't get much better than that. Um, his axe work's brilliant. He's, he's selected the stems and seen where they'll fit best. It's just a nice... No, it is left-handed. Yes, thank you for that. Yes. Right-handed cutting is the direction you... It's where you lay the stems to the left and hold your tool in your right hand, which is what most people do. Cutting left-handed is laying the stems to the right. And if you, <laughs> you're cutting under your arm, which could be quite dangerous. Yes, that's left-handed cutting. There is a story behind that which is political and I'll, but I better keep that to myself. That hedge should have been cut right-handed, but it, uh, anyway, there's a, a political story there which didn't involve Jonathan. Um, 
you're left on it cutting you always cut as you all probably know you always cut uphill um it's not necessarily because the sap doesn't run properly if you cut the other way but the hedge looks awfully flat even on a slight slope if you cut the wrong way um if you're on a level cut it either way uh, i've cut them left-handed to, to fill a gap you know where it's going to look best or make the best fence if you cut it the opposite way then cut it the opposite way uh, but thanks for the question about left-handed cutting um now then oh dear <laughs> somebody's got a similar political dilemma um we will uh, we'll discuss politics another time I, we'll, it's, a, it's a difficult topic um derek did yes. you want to explain about this double cut this double cutting that yes, it will. yes thank you for that was that sarah again yes it's sarah. yes it's, yes the i'm losing track of the question we've got, i've got to cover again you have to remind me but yes uh side cutting whatever you want to call it that basic oh how to cut was one of them wasn't it we've got to cover the ecological benefits um that basic cutting the cutting which you do to make the hinge to bring the pleach down to the angle you want it uh, that same cut can be used at any angle so you can see there you've got your little cross somewhere haven't you? there's a beauty in the middle there yeah. um jonathan's put an, a second cut in there to straighten that pleach it would have been sticking up probably sticking up right to the top of the binders if he hadn't done that so he's cut it again to make it fit now you could cut it it's cut it on the top there he could have cut it he could have cut it on the back on the front underneath depending on which way you wanted to bend it there's another one off to yeah. that's the one you're brilliant with this aren't you Sarah it's good um there's one he's cut it on the front again so it doesn't stick out the front it's because it's it's going back in and touching the stakes there's another one another one near the top you're not supposed to do them near the top that's competition cutting but um so that's the reason uh find some people can't grasp that somehow they want to put the cuts in the same place but that's it I've put certainly put five cuts in a single pleach to get it straight before now you get some real nightmare good strangely enough hedges which haven't been cut before maiden hedges are particularly bad they don't grow straight um so you might put a lot of cuts in in quite a young hedge uh once a hedge has been laid it grows straight it's much easier so that's that one um i'm not sure what the next slide is right so let's go back to let's go back to jonathan's hedge because it's a nice example brilliant and we're going to cover how to now you really need to demonstrate this how to make a basic cut easiest to explain probably say you've got a nice a nice hedge with sort of two three inch diameter stems nice young hedge 10 years old eight years old 10 years old um don't kneel down squat or bend Put your hand on the stem with your knuckles facing your tool i'm doing that you won't be able to see me do it so i'm doing it as i'm talking um visualize a line from five times the diameter of the stem from the ground you know three inch diameter, yeah, two inch diameter stem ten inches up yeah a bit more thicker stem and visualize that line going four fifths of the way through the stem use your bill hook or if it's a bigger stem, the axe, and bury it with your first strike. Really get it stuck into that line you've visualized. Otherwise, it's probably skid off the front. Really hit it. Your next stem, a bit more gentle. And as you're doing that on a nice thin stem, push with your left hand. You cut your right hand and push with your left hand. And as you work that cut down in more gentle and sort of slicing cuts on that same line you've visualized, Try and feel where it's where the stem starts to give. And you want it to you want it to give when it's about two, three inches off the ground. You want to feel that give. Use your bill up, waggle your bill up, use it as a lever to make the grain run, and then bring the pleach down on that hinge you've created. That sounds so easy, doesn't it? Base that's the basic idea. It's it takes confidence, I think. Um if it's a bigger stem you won't be able to grasp it with your hands so much you're gonna to have to judge it if you and if it's 
there's a, a rule of thumb and doesn't always apply one inch of pound weight of tool for every inch diameter stem but by the time you get up to three inch stem you'll pick your axe up you'll put your bill up down and pick the axe up um same principle applies if you're using a chainsaw or even and drop your axe into the the the, the, uh, the drain run when you get somewhere down but it's the same sort of thing you're aiming to create that hinge and you want to really feel that hinge being created when it's when you're still above the ground don't don't keep hacking into the ground don't keep pushing the cut right down make the drain run and separate so it's at ground level that hinge is created is that making any sense to anybody i'll try and do a video with this one day okay questions are not coming in what's happening uh, um right we'll, we'll go on to we'll go on to the next one um the, yeah next slide please tools and tool making We've been talking about this modern tools really aren't fit for the job and you're really looking for old tools um unfortunately and we've gone to the next slide next slide please it's a story behind this this is the, this is the man who made my billock he worked for elwell company all his working life died six months after he, he retired he's that's a picture from the last Elwell catalogue. I met an Elwell Smith, handed him my bill up, and Elwell made thousands upon thousands upon thousands of bill ups. And this man said, Sam made that. I said, what? He said, Sam Spooner made it. He was great he was. That's a picture of Sam Spooner making a seven pound axe head with a 12 pound hammer. Right, let's go back a step. We're not with the slides. Um, the benefits to agriculture you stop in um drift aren't you stop in uh, erosion you stop in drift from chemicals field to field um such things i'm getting it's a matter of which way around the you get asked about are you destroying the hedges and well you're you're killing the hedge no you're not you're actually rejuvenating you're making it better and with most of the styles, you get immediate benefits. This, this struck home to me some years ago. You know, this sort of time of year, three or four o'clock in the afternoon, you're starting to pack your tools away, look back at the hedge, and there's birds flying in, and there's voles running into the bottom because they've got new accommodation. They've got shelter. They've got feeding places, and that's what they use. In spring, they'll be, they'll be nesting in there, feeding through summer um come the next autumn winter the hedgehogs and the toads will be hibernating in there um you've, you've created welcoming new habitat and it's an immediate result it's a short-term result there's an intermediate result there's a long-term result i mentioned to sarah yesterday i was laying a hedge with a an ex-trainee and now a friend of mine and we've been watching the birds move into each section of hedge we've laid as we've done it as we moved along we'd see the birds flying in and then one day we both ducked at the same instant because sparrowhawk had seen the same thing we'd been watching and he just missed the heads and went in after these birds so it's it's nature it's great it's uh it's very satisfying um if you want to cut back to me i'll wave a bill look at you when i'll take any more questions Hello. That's a Yorkshire style bill. There's, there's many, many, many different styles. We think that's probably a market employee. The reps went out and said, we've got a bill named after your village. Would you like to buy a dozen? Um, this is a tool of choice for many hedge layers now. It's got weight, two edges used for different purposes. He used the curved one for trimming, basically that the straight one for laying. And with a long handle, you can actually use it as a, a three pound axe. There, when you get onto stem that's too big for the bill up. Oh, ah. this is now well rounding and buttressing axe, six pound, pound lighter than standard that they used to use. But nice thin blade, a good one. Sorry, I've just seen a question there. I'll click on it again. 
How do you use to sharpen the tools? <laughs> the old ones are the new tools need an awful lot of sharpening. You start off though, you see that that's quite a thin, probably can't see it too well. It's quite a thin blade. But there's no sharp, uh, no, no abrupt shoulder on it. Do it that way. It's actually quite it's quite a smooth transition from the edge into the thickness of the blade. See, modern ones are awful. They've been ground at a really, really sharp angle, and you've got a, a line along there. So the first thing you do is, with a whetstone grinder, hand-cranked, modern electric one if you like, but a, a whetstone, water-cooled wheel, take the shoulder off. After that, and same with the axe as well, after that, your choice, carborundum stone, oil stone, whatever to get the final finish and the final edge on it. Um, got a rule there, actually. If you hold it to the light and you can see a white line along the, the edge, it's very difficult doing things backwards on, on, the, on the screen. If you see a white line along the, don't do that, you'll cut your finger, but <laughs> see a white line along the edge, it's not sharp. I shouldn't see a white line at all. Uh, use diamond sharpeners, hand, diamond sharpeners. Um, somebody I know polishes his tools with um, Autosol motorbike polish. Uh, it might help. Use a strop, get a real edge on it. Two of the best edge layers I know just use a chainsaw file, a flat single cut file. But it needs to be sharp, whatever, and with no shoulder. So biggest biggest problem is particularly with volunteer groups is is having sharp tools getting them sharp and looking after them was that was that a reasonable answer well thank you Derek that that's all very interesting thank you um I, I very would go into... bit, but, uh, there you go <laughs> Thank you. So um, now we're open for questions and I'll kick yeah. off by um, asking. So what are you, your views on, uh, you know, apprentices, learning the skill? It's such an art form, isn't it? Hedge laying and yeah. all the pictures you were showing just made me think, wow, you know, that I, I tried <laughs> hedge laying, laying once and, you know, I was terrified of cutting my, my hand off or my fingers or something like that with a bill hook. So, I mean, what do you think about, you know, apprentices and more, you know, uh, people learning hedge laying is a skill for the future. It's tricky because uh, on our courses, we, we struggle to get youngsters. Um, we had a 14 year old on the last course. Hmm. Young farmers, it's uh, they find it better to sit in an air conditioned tractor cab than to get in a wet hedge bottom. So it's not that popular. We've got young farmer competitions around here, hmm. uh, which is good, but generally, it's not easy to get youngsters into it. Um, in fact, I've got an older trainee who's now giving up his good job in his edge lane. That's what he's oh, always wanted to do. Oh. <laughs> you know? um, I mean, and the, way, I, a, the way I suggest people learn is to come on a course like ours. Mm. Um, run by a, I mean, ours a ploughing edge cutting society. Edge cutting is another word for hedge lane. Mm. Um, long established. We've got... Our trainers are professional edge layers and experienced trainers as well. Mm. So there are other people who train and the standards vary. And we'll not be political again. <laughs> go, go, go to a, an established society, go on one of their courses. And then after that, adopt a hedge layer. Go and find a hedge layer and labor for them, work with them. And I was very fortunate. I said at the start, I was very fortunate. I'd done a course bumped into Jeff who had met a completely different walk of life and that was it I spent several years being sworn at regularly he was a real gentleman actually oh. he wasn't swearing mixed company but he had a pet name he had a pet name for me oh. um yeah, which I won't repeat here uh, um that is the way to do it if you can go and work with somebody who's got the experience and through that I mean I showed you pictures of really tall hedges Mm. Um, you wouldn't know how to tackle them unless you've worked with somebody who'd done it yes uh, thank you, you know, certainly you can use a rope props whatever but it's not in the book there's no books you know <laughs> it's, it's all it's all word of mouth that's it it's practical isn't it 
and yeah. thank you there's um there are some questions coming into yeah, the chat um but also if people do want to raise their hands now um that's absolutely fine i'll try and keep track of that so it's under the reactions uh icon at the bottom of the screen if yeah. you want to raise your hand and ask a direct question you can but there are some questions in the chat so there's one from yeah. uh lynn is first yeah and it's asking about well you can see that <laughs> wildlife conservation styles one does work what are, the ones that don't work are the ones i mentioned where they where they, they, they put rough cuts in and squash it flat with a digger butt kit that they would die there's one close to where i live that was done that way and he died um there's another conservation style which is which uses the the correct way of cutting. They're probably going a bit cheaper on on staking, using less stakes, not building, not as smart. Yeah, let's put it that way. It's just not as as polished and as smart as as some of those have shown you. But it's doing the job. It's still it's still a fence. It's still held in place, and it will still grow the right way. So those wildlife conservation styles do work, but not the the chainsaw and push it over with a bucket. No, not that one. Uh, what's up? There's another question there, wasn't there? Mm. Was there? Yeah, where's it gone? Ah, damn. What type uh, of chainsaw? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm flicking past one. I use a little chainsaw. Um, oh, there's one above that. Yeah, that's about flailing, isn't it? As well. Um, Yeah, it's cost, it's pence per metre to flail, and it's pounds and pounds per metre to lay edges, and that's the problem. Um, so there should be some move towards these conservation styles, probably. But we need to, I think we need to hang on to the principles, the very principles of why we do it, so we don't lose those in the process, like with a mechanical method. So it it is a problem. Um, it's cost. But there we go. Um, right, use a little... MS 170 because it's so light. What do you prefer? I started with MS 170. Uh, it's fine. You don't need more than a. Usually, don't need more than a 14 inch bar, and your hedge laying. Sometimes you do, but you know, an MS the, on M, the 180s quite popular. I've got an MS 200 which I don't make any longer, which is fabulous. It's the it's the back handled top handled one, high speed clean cuts. It's a really nice saw. Um, but they're about six hundred pounds when they stopped making them a few years ago. So yeah, small saws. Uh, there's one is deceased now, unfortunately. One top edge layer used to regard those small stills as disposable. He'd use them for a season, and he put that pay it's a commercial cutter. It's fine. They're, they're very suitable. I've got a little echo as well. Don't need big saws usually <laughs> until you're laying stuff twelve inches diameter and thirty feet tall. You're not going to do that straight away, are you? Um, yeah, difference price between laying hedge and replacing with stock fencing. I suppose you've got to say that laying is, is the, the long term thing. Um, a laid hedge will last longer than a fence, the fence will rot. Um, so that's a good reason to keep laying hedges. Uh, hedges used to be laid on a cycle, um, mentioned the middle one, eight to 15 year cycle. And it would be winter when the farm labourers didn't have other door jobs to do. They would be out edging and ditching. It all made sense then. Then we got mechanical trimming came in. And that's where we are now, really. Um, so the hedges have been left. So the hedges have not laid for 50, 60 years, maybe laid badly in the past. Um, they present problems in themselves. Uh, if, ideally, if you can plant a hedge, let it grow, Trim the sides up, um, lay it again eight, eight, 10, 15 years later, great. But of course, that's not practical on farms necessarily. So they will get flailed. Um, but the straight answer is hedges last longer than fences. Fences rot. Oh, You've have we got, got some another more? question. Uh, I think that on my screen, how they're coming up, there's one about the bus stop hedge. How much prep work was needed? Uh, yeah, so if you can see that question there. Yeah. <laughs> How much prep was needed high on the brush before you started cutting? Well, we argue about this sometimes. 
unfortunately, I've not got the other picture with me. There's a picture of me and Jeff working on it close up. Um, it's a Derby hedge, so it's side it up. You're taking branches off to about eye height, anything sticking out. You're leaving the back, except for anything, again, sticking well out. Because when that comes down, I'll give you a clue on that as well. Um, so basically, we didn't take much off. We brought it down full height. Uh, it's it's It defeats the geometry somehow. You'd think the angles had changed, but I mean, I've laid 30 foot high hedges without taking the tops off. And they they look a bit flatter than a shorter one, but not much. It's quite strange. Um, now, Jeff had a, a this saying about a half open fan. If you if you imagine yourself standing on the hedge line and looking down at the the the, the stems of your, the trees you've got to lay, and you've sided one side up to that eye height, one side smooth to that height, and then imagine a lady's fan half opened. So you've got that's your brush, the, the open side of the fan, and that comes down as you lay in the hedge. Each each piece on top of each piece, and that makes a parallel wide back. So don't take everything off. Leave as much on as you can, or as much on as you need to make the back of the hedge the width you want. So have fun with your hedge because you're going to be if it's a big one, you're going to be struggling with it. But it'll be fantastic when it comes down. It'll make a really strong hedge. Was that all right? I think two new messages. Oh dear. Half open fan. And it took me some time to understand that, but it makes total sense now. Have we got some more? It's all gone very quiet. Derek, did you answer yeah. the question about the Derbyshire style without binders? Are the bleachers we yeah, did, did that? that? Yes, it, it, done that? it's because because we work the bleachers onto the stake. We use stout stake. And we work the pleaters onto them. So we're actually weaving, constructing a hedge as we're going, as we're moving forward with it. We're building it to height and it's solid as we go along. Okay, it's thank easy you. to demonstrate. <laughs> what else do we have? I think looking back at the questions, I think the uh, during your presentation, some questions were uh, asked. And you, I think you've answered all of the um, other questions. Uh, so unless um, Sarah, um, unless there are other questions, um, just having a look if anyone's got any hands up. I don't think there are. So I don't think we've got any other questions from anybody. So yeah, yeah so thank you so so much, Derek, for for taking the time to give us such an insight into hedge laying, the art of hedge laying. And uh, yes, and, and thank you so much. And as I said earlier, CPRE Shropshire are engaged with a local Hedgerow Heroes project, planting and restoring hedgerows. And we have groups um, around the country doing that as well. And we hope to be able to do it in the future too. So um, at CPRE, it's not only about saying we want 40% more hedgerows by 2050, but also how they can be delivered on the ground. And um, I sure I mentioned yesterday, we launched a report about how farmers are, are managing hedgerows. So over a thousand people took part, farmers took part. We launched that in Parliament yesterday. So I'll put that in the chat, a link to that report, so you can see that. It's really, really interesting, you know, talking about the, the barriers to what hedge, you know, laying, hedge planting, so hedgerow management, the barriers, the opportunities, what funding's needed, that sort of thing. So quite an interesting insight from farmers on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you I so much, Derek. If anybody wants to get them, do and my email address. If anyone's got any questions later on, I'm quite happy to answer. Um, yeah, anything else you want to know in future that I might be able to answer. Um, just thinking too, it's <laughs> my mentor, Jeff, he always referred to hedge lane as work. It's work, yeah, until his final years. Then he said, you take a pile of rubbish and turn it into a, turn it into a thing of beauty. And that was about it, wasn't it? And he did that over and over and over again. Um, I suppose the other thing about that is don't be frightened of it. Get on with it, have a go. 
you get there. One more, right? Of Hi. course, drop me an email. I'll tell you about them and any others I can put you in touch with. Um, Brilliant. Well, thank course. you so much. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, have a lovely evening, everyone else, and thank you again, Derek. Thank what you I will, me. What oh, I will do, Sarah. everyone, it's Sarah here. Um, I'll email everyone with Derek's email address if he's happy for yeah. me to do that. And I'll also put your link in, Emma, so everyone's got that in case people disappear. Oh, yes, it. of course. Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Derek, again. Okay, thank you. Okay. All the best, everyone. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.